Welcome to the You Can Make a Living in the Music Industry podcast from Nashville, Tennessee. I am your host, John Martin Keith. Celebrities, working class musicians, and people who work behind the scenes in all areas of the music industry will share their stories, encourage you, and give practical advice of ways you can make a living doing what you love in the music industry. This episode is brought to you by Eden Brook Productions. Eden Brook Productions is the company I founded to help musicians grow in their craft. Are you a songwriter, but maybe you've been told your songs aren't quite there yet? Or are your songs ready, but you don't feel stage ready? Or maybe music is your passion, but you feel imprisoned by your day job and you don't know what to do next to make your dream a reality. Well, Eden Brook Productions is here to help. We offer consulting services via phone call, Skype, and FaceTime. And for the You Can Make a Living in the Music Industry podcast listeners, we're offering an introductory one-hour consultation special. Click on the link in the show notes to contact me, and let's get you making a living in the music industry. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show today. This week, I'm talking with my friend, Rhea Stevens. Rhea is a very successful indie pop artist who also makes a great living in the sync world. She's had placements on Lifetime, Peacock, Disney+, Plus, ABC, Hallmark, and much, much more, plus multiple commercial ads. We're discussing filling a hole needed in the sync industry with Christmas music, how to reach out to outlets who review music, and how to take the next best step when things don't work out the way you hope, which most of us have dealt with. <laughs> so please enjoy my conversation with Rhea Stevens. Hey, everyone. I am talking with Rhea Stevens. Hi, hey, Rhea. How are you today? I'm excellent. How are you? I am doing great. It is so good to finally get to see talk to you in person. Um, you and I have known each other kind of from a distance for about, gosh, about four years now, I think, at, at the time of this recording. So you and I went, so people listening to that have listened to the podcast for the past few seasons will be familiar with the name Catch the Moon Music, and um, which is a sync licensing agency that used to exist. I don't think they, they do it any longer in that way. But um, at the time, it was a program, there was a like a kind of a course that we went through, a bunch of us went through to learn how to do sync music and uh, that kind of stuff. And you and I were both in that sort of at the same time and know a lot of people through that. And for whatever reason, we never connected really through that personally and got to work together. So I'm excited that uh, all these years later, we finally get to say hello and have a conversation. <laughs> Yes, and congratulations on all of your success and your podcast. Well, yeah. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, thank you, and congratulations on yours. You've been killing it in the sync world uh, the past few years, and just having lots and lots of placements on different on different projects and shows and things like that. And so, I'm excited to talk with you about that and kind of learn your history and how you have been successful doing music and doing sync music specifically. And um, so I'm look, looking forward to getting kind of into a deep dive in that conversation with you. Let's do it. I'm looking forward right. to it. Well, tell us uh, who you are, where you're from, and what got you down the path into the music business. Well, obviously, my name is Rhea Stevens, and um, I grew up in a musical family. Um, my dad is um, actually a Ukrainian immigrant who grew up um learning to play music on an accordion. Wow. So he played accordion in church as a kid um, every day. My grandfather, uh, his dad has, is a, was a hymn writer. So there's still a lot of his old hymns floating around in Ukrainian hymnals. Um, wow. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that it, is really neat. It, it is really, it, it's, it's interesting to, um, to kind of be at this point in my life where I can look, where I can dive into the history of my relatives more. Um, but my dad was, he basically grew up in a household where they could only, they were, they were taken in by missionaries when he was a kid and sponsored by missionaries. So they could only have Bibles and encyclopedias in the house okay. wow. was basically how it was, but he was sneaking out to nightclubs uh, and learning how to improvise. And he's just a phenomenal keyboard player. So um, 
he worked for Disney in the 70s when I was just a kid uh, during the Mickey Mouse club era when it was like the facts of life cast and all of that. Yeah. Um, So we had musicians and singers and arrangers just coming into our home all the time. Um, So that was kind of like the backdrop of how I grew up. But really for me, I was in my bedroom listening to music from the time that I was a toddler, just studying it really. I mean, I think my family thought there might be something wrong with me because I would just sit in a rocking chair and listen to the same record over and over and over. And I remember as a kid just loving the song so much, but but always thinking, how did where did they come from? Where did these songs come from? And that is I love that melody. I that how did they do that? I mean, and I'm talking about, you know, two, three years old and having no musical skill. Um, whatsoever. But, um, you know, growing up, I, I was always at recess and at lunch as a kid, I was under a tree with my notebook, um, writing songs. I was always writing songs in class. I was just obsessed with music. You know, I mean, my parents used to have to say, you have got to come out of your room away from these 10 tape recorders that you've set up to try to make your little albums. You've got to go outside and play. Yeah. I mean, ever since I was a kid, I was, com- I've just been compelled by music. Um, so, I mean, for me, there there was no, uh, there was no way that I wasn't going to do music professionally because there was my focus and my heart has always been in this. So when I was you know, 1920 and moved down to Los Angeles and the music industry was basically falling apart at that time, you know, Napster, everything that was going on with Napster. I mean, I made all the rounds to the record labels. Um, and every manager that I spoke to would basically sit in their big office chair and tell me, you know, that they didn't know where their careers were going and that the industry was coming apart and they didn't know where any of the funding for anything was going to be coming from anymore. And I should go, go to college and get a, get a more practical degree and forget about the music industry altogether. I mean, it was like, Oh (laughs) my gosh. I mean, but, but the thing is, is that I, it wasn't a deterrent. It was just like, okay, well then I have to find a way. I just have to find a way. So what I did was I started sitting in, in every single club, um, the baked potato lavalier, which is no longer, um, in Los Angeles. I mean, any of the little clubs on the West side. And I just got to know the musicians and the producers and the writers in town. Um, in Los Angeles. And I just started working with anybody who would work with me, which later changed quite a bit. As I worked with so many people, I realized how difficult and how complicated that can be. So I really, my circle has become very, a lot smaller over the years. Um, but I started sitting in clubs and I, I got, um, a gig working for Dubois entertainment and one of their top um, their top 40 bands, um, and just started working as a professional singer around town and doing a lot of sessions and things like that. I went back and forth to Nashville a few times. Um, but really what happened was I just started recording, um, songs with producers that were doing music for film and TV, and I would get random placements in film and TV. I, the first person that got me a placement was a guy named Mike Noma, who I adore, love Mike Noma, Noma music. Um, and he would place my songs. Hey, you know, Ray, I got this placement for you. It's going to be on this TV show. And I was going, okay, so why? And I would send him a bunch of songs and some of them would get placed and some of them would not. Um, and I was making all kinds of music that I really believed in. Um, 
and some of it would get placed and some of it would not. Mm -hmm. And, um, I know that, I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah. And so when I heard of catch the moon, um, and what Kathy was doing, I just thought, well, I mean, at this point, there's nothing, the, the versatility of what I, I was capable of as a writer was broad enough because this is something that I'd been doing daily. It's not like, I would just do it when a gig came up. You know what I mean? It's like I, I would just write and record because I loved doing it. Um, and then when I learned in Catch the Moon, all of the themes and everything that worked, I made a bunch of that music. But what was really interesting about it uh, was I made a huge satchel of that sync, you know, of those, those kind of syncable songs. But in the middle of it, I was kind of looking around going, you know, I love great arrangements. I love um, really imaginative uh, lyrics. I love uh, really, really musical stuff. And I know that the team that I'm working with could do it, but there's no Christmas stuff out there that's that's new and fresh, but that also sounds uh, familiar. And that's fine. And I think this is something that I can do. And I remember even talking to people in Catch the Moon and even my own teammates were going, I don't want to do Christmas. It only comes once a year. And, you know, but I just really, I just had this, this jonesing to do it. And I did it. I made an all original Christmas album. And that has been so, the Christmas stuff that I've done has been so much more successful than anything else that I've ever done. Mm. And what's interesting is everybody was saying, don't do it. It's not, you know, it's just, it's that stuff can be, you know, there, there's, there's already a vast catalog of, uh, you know, what would you call it? Like legacy, legacy right. artists that have that stuff. And sure. um, I'm so glad that I did it because I have been having so much fun. Yeah. So much fun doing it. So, I mean, I guess I would say to anybody out there is that learn, learn what it is that you need to learn and then throw it away, <laughs> to, you know, <laughs> apply it to whatever, but there is a path for you. You know, if, if this spirit of making music was put into you and, and I, I think if you're not going into it, like, um, if you're going into it because you love it and you have to do it um, because it's what what's in your heart to do, find that artist in you. Don't abandon that artist in you and apply what is needed in sync and to find a way to marry your artist self with your with your crafting self, because I think that's where the sweet spot is. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Um, I love doing Christmas music for sync stuff. I've written, uh, done a few originals and some covers, and um, I really enjoy it. I think there's always a place for it, even like they said, the legacy artists that kind of everyone knows about, but you can't always, a lot of productions are, or shows or movies are not able to get the legacy yeah. versions are not, it's too expensive or whatever it is. So they're there always looking for all songs. Right. So they're, yeah. they're looking for alternatives. And um, so I think that, you know, when a great artist, indie artist or someone who is not, not to the caliber of Mariah Carey or whoever it's going to be, Bing Crosby or whoever, um, but can do an amazing version of a song that maybe they have done that a production was like, Oh, that's, that's the direction we need to go. Then you've supplied something that no one else has. You know, yes. and and I mean, Christmas comes around every year and it lasts, you know, they start playing it in October, you know, there, even before Halloween. Now your Hallmark channel is playing Christmas music. Right. And then you got Christmas in July now. So you got a whole month in the middle of the year that's playing Christmas stuff. So there's always there's always a market for it, actually. Yeah. And so I, I'm with you. I agree with you on that when it comes to the Christmas stuff. So now I know you do other music, just, you know, pop contemporary music or whatever, but have you, have you really kind of honed in and focused on going forward that, okay, Christmas music is going to be my genre. I'm going to really kind of pursue that 
kind of more full time than I would my re- my other music that would as an artist or whatever, just because you know the value that you that you bring to it and uh, the amount of it that yeah. you can do. Does it make sense? Well, I mean, I think for with Chris, as long as the Christmas music is um, those melodies and all of those arrangements and all, as long as that's still inspiring me, I'll keep doing that um, year round. But I actually just finished a pop R and B okay. dance album that I'm crazy about. I mean, my my lane um, is you know pop soul kind of okay. stuff and, and dance type of stuff. Right. I just could not give that stuff away sure. for years and years and years. And those records are expensive to make. Um, but they're so much fun. I mean, it's, it's just so <laughs> much fun. Well, I saw that so, you did um, on your website. I know that you got listed. People need to go check out your website, reyesstevens.com, right? And uh, just check out your music and kind of see what all you've done. But I remember looking on your website, kind of off to the right, seeing a bunch of different albums and singles that yeah. you've created. And you've done stuff with Tamara Bubble and Son- Sonnet Simmons and people that we went through Catch the Moon with uh, who've gone on to be incredibly successful in in sync and, and as artists outside of the sync world. Um, so that's cool that you and I, I think you're probably talking about that to some degree, kind of in that pop dance world. Of, yeah, I um, love doing that stuff. And I just did a, a wrote a big band um, song called The Good Life for a fabulous legacy artist named um, Tony Gala. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the things that I that I write, I'll start off with ideas and I just think, gosh, you know what? This really sounds like it would be great for, for dream on. And maybe we could get tomorrow on a, on a wrap or this, or maybe Sonnet would be interested in doing this. I just love making music. Um, I just genuinely am a studio rat and I have my wish list of artists that I'd love to work with. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. always kind of, it's, always in my mind, oh my gosh, this year I'd love to work with this person or, or, or that person. And I just, um, keep my antenna out there all the time as far as song ideas go. Um, and I just tune into that every day and write song ideas and keep them in my phone. And if somebody wants to co-write on something great, um, and I just keep making my own music too. So I'm really an artist. Uh, I would say a pop soul artist with a penchant for making Christmas music. And I write for other people and with other people too. Yeah. Uh, that's great. I, I appreciate you sharing all that stuff. So um, when you work in the sync side of things and you're writing for other people or with other people, mm-hmm. um, talk a bit about how that has become like, how did, how did you start being able to, to stretch your wings and start working with other writers and other producers to the point that people are coming to you wanting to work with you as, a, as opposed to you trying to ask people to work, to work yeah. with you. Does that make sense? Because we well, all, we all start out to that place where, you know, Hey, I need, I'd love to work with this person. I'd love to write with this person. Will you come write with me? And then at some point it flips and yeah. then those people start coming to you and it's such a, that's always a relief. It's kind of like a weight off your shoulders when people start asking you for stuff as opposed to the way around. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I still reach out to people that I want to work with. I just, um, uh, when I'm, it, it depends on what season I'm in. I mean, if I'm working on my own project, there's usually not a lot of room to take on other things. Um, and I think the hardest thing for me when people reach out to me and they want to do something is usually I'm in the middle of something at that time. And I'm not sure when exactly I'm going to be coming up for air. Mm -hmm. So I don't like to disappoint people and say, okay, we, I can start working on this at this, you know, at this time and then I have to let anybody down. So I still prefer when I have an open window to, to be the one to reach out just because I don't want to be disappointing anybody because I know how that feels right. because I've gone through that. Um, but I love it 
when people reach out to me and say, Hey, as long as, as long as they actually know what I do, I think the thing sometimes in our business, the etiquette thing can be a little funky, um, where people reach out to you because they know that you've had placements. Right. Um, and they just want, what they're really saying is, um, Hey, you know, write something with me. That's going to work for sync and teach me how to do my own PR and pitch it for me and make me money. And that's overwhelming. Um, so, but when somebody reaches out to me and they say, I love this song that, that you did, or I have this album and um, I mean, I have a friend, a colleague who's been saying this for a couple of years to me. Oh my gosh, this song Paradise that you wrote, I listen to it all the time and we got to write something and we still haven't gotten around to it, but I know that we would have fun because I've worked with him in a lot of different musical settings and I know his voice and I know his, um, I know that he really loves doing this. So whether something would sink or not, we would have a rich musical experience and we would have a blast doing it. So I might be a little bit of kind of a different person to talk to about this because for me, yes, music is a business, but you know, you have your bank account, you know, your, your money bank account, but you have your soul bank account too. So I'm, all, I'm I'm very engaged with my soul bank account. So I like <laughs> working with things that are going to re-energize me artistically. Um, and usually, honestly, those are the things that wind up being successful. Mm-hmm. So, sure. um, but, you know, I mean, even with, um, I mean, Tamara and Dre, I think they would tell you that I was definitely chasing them to do that. <laughs> Right, <laughs> and yeah. that song ended up being really successful. I think that Sonnet would probably tell you that I was chasing her to do that, and that song has ended up sinking like nine or ten times. That's so great. sometimes you do. I, I mean, but that's just the way that it went. It's b- because the song seeds were coming from me, and I believed in them so much that I was, you know, I felt like I was kind of wrangling horses, you know, come on guys, this is going to be great. You're going to have got this yeah. producer and that producer and blah, 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 blah. And that enthusiasm, um, I think pushed it up, uphill. Cause you're really kind of, sometimes you are pushing that boulder uphill and it's really, really worth it. Um, but I guess when somebody is reaching out to me, I never want to feel like I'm the boulder that they have to push uphill. I want to be fully present and available because when I, I think anybody who's worked with me would say that um, I'm completely immersive. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's all consuming and I'm really the details and all of it. It's um, I just really, really get inside of it. So are you a com- uh, do you consider yourself uh, more of a composer? Like do you, do you get in and like, on the production side of things and really, you know, produce as opposed to just giving the ideas and the lyrics side of it, but like really creating you you said earlier that you wrote some, a big band piece for an artist. I'm like, okay. Well, you know, I mean, are you writing the parts for the, for the, like, are you going that, that, that detailed was or Steve Lane. you okay. know, I think the biggest compliment that I've ever received, um, from a great arranger was that, you know, whether working on Christmas or big band stuff is that, Hey, you know, that with the song, the way that it is, the parts write themselves. So I, what I do is I come up with the best melody, the best lyric that I can, and basically, you know, craft out my own kind of singer songwriter um, arrangement. Um, And then I'll choose the arranger that I want to work with, but I'll say, this is the reference. This is the kind of big band track, or this is the kind of vibe that I'm looking for for this. And then that arranger might say, well, instead of going, um, completely Glenn Miller on that, you know, why don't we 
why don't we pare it down a little bit? And what if we did this or that? And then we start talking it through. And then once we both have a vision, you know, they'll start the arrangement around my vocal. And then I go back and I re-record the vocal and do the background vocal arrangements. And yeah. we kind of drive it home together. Sure. You know, like I'll, I'll get a mix back and I'll say, um, I think in here we need to, let's mute these things. Let's bring this up here. Let's, um, what if we had this type of horn line here or, or whatever it is. Um, but I love choosing the musicians. I love, um, I just, I just really love the whole process. Yeah. Well, I think we work in a very similar style because, um, when I work with other writers and artists, I usually end up producing and, and engineering and kind of laying out that stuff. But, you know, Jessica Bird, who is a, another artist that we went through the program with, um, she and I have done a lot of stuff together over the years. And yeah. we work we work in a very similar fashion where I'll have her send me uh, a lyric and a melody melody of something and piano or guitar that she does. She'll, as a scratch, she'll send it out to me. I'll build a track around it. Then she'll go back and she'll re-record the vocals, and and then we'll kind of like narrow, you know, narrow it down from that point and and put something cool together, and then send it out and start, you know, pitching and whatever that kind of stuff. So uh, I feel I've like I've heard that's a very what you, similar... you guys have done, and it's it's great stuff. Oh, thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I was actually listening through some stuff today, and you know, and I I'm like, man, these are really good, <laughs> and it's yeah. all, what, what's always it's a frustrating thing for, for people like us who, who live in the sync world. And, um, we have these songs that we're so passionate about and we're so excited about it. Like this is, we just feel like these are number one songs. We like, these are, this is, there's no reason this shouldn't be getting placed on multiple shows or movies or whatever it is. And, um, and then sometimes they just sit there for years. It feels like, and nothing ever happens. You know, you got them in, libraries or sync agencies have them and they're out getting pitched and you know that it's you know they're they're out there but then it feels like nothing happens and i know that things can happen years down the road and that's what it, it needed to wait until then and you get fifty thousand dollars like oh that's amazing it was worth the wait but sometimes waiting for that time to come feels like an eternity and you don't know why those things are happening um so that's just kind of the the reality that we live in in this world I have found that every good thing in life takes time. I mean, Mm -hmm. everything takes time. I mean, I look back at my own road and all of the, the records that I'm very proud of that I made that never went anywhere, (laughs) you know, monetarily, but they were so fulfilling for me to make. Um, I mean, I'm sure that, that your relationships with your co-writers, I mean, I have so many rich memories of, of making a lot of this music with my friends. And Mm -hmm. those are the, the, some of the best memories of my life. Sure. Um, so for me, I would do it whether the, the money was coming in or not. Um, what I find though happens with most teens, which is very unfortunate, is that you get this fire in your belly, you all come together, you make a bunch of this music. Um, And I know for me, I was the one, um, when I first got into the sync world intentionally, not kind of this in this haphazard way where things were kind of getting synced here and there. But when I took the Catch the Moon course, and I, I was, I only wrote with my team of brothers that I had been working with for years and years and years because I just wanted a streamlined process, um, and I wanted to really grow with one team. Um, and I found this with a lot of people during Catch the Moon that y- we made a lot of that music. And it didn't sink a year later and it didn't sink two years later. And it became um, really like emotionally taxing to keep motivating or keep being the lifeblood and the enthusiasm for my musical team to keep them going. 
And then, so everybody fell by the wayside. Oh, you know, I just, you know, people moved away. People said, I just, you know, need to focus on other things. And then what happens three, four years later, that stuff started getting synced left and right Mm -hmm. and left and right. And like unbelievably so where it was becoming ridiculous you know, it was just every week, it just seemed like, hey, guys, this one's come in, this one's come in. But we had all separated at that point, I had started working with new people, continuing with sync, because for me, this is a career path for me, I have to write music, I have to make music. Right. Um, you know, whether it flies or doesn't fly, it's just something that I have to be doing every day. So I found new people to work with. And then the older teams that you worked with where that stuff is being really successful, then they want to get back together and they want to start all over again. Yeah. You can't do that. And you can't do that because you're, you're working with new people and you're, you're dedicated to the thing that you're working on. But then you end up in a similar position telling your new team, look, this can take time. You know, the stuff that we make here, it, everybody knows there's no guarantee, but it might take a year or two years or three years or four years. So you just have to tell them. And what I tell my teams now is if you are getting tired, you need to tell me and it's okay because I will just plow through. And I'm just going to keep going mm-hmm. yep. because for me, I want to produce two, three, four songs a month. Um, and just, I've set up my life, um, to where I can do that. But I understand that not everybody is, um, can do that and that's okay. So, so just knowing that, um, is good. But what I would say to any artist that's really into this is just keep making music, keep making music that you believe in. Um, don't just stop and wait for your ship to come in. I mean, if you need a break, by all means, take a break. But I'm so glad that when my first sync writing team kind of fell by the wayside because things weren't syncing fast enough, I'm so glad that I went ahead and worked with Sonnet and worked with Dree and worked with Tamara and worked with uh, Tony Gala and made a new Christmas album because that stuff, that took time too. It took a couple of years, but it's done really well. Yeah. But for me, this is a musical journey that I'm on that I just need to keep walking. Sure. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because like you just said a minute ago, you're in a position now to where you can record three or four songs a month. And uh, this is, this is I'm assuming this is all you do for a living, um, or at least the majority of what you do for a living. And um, so what allows you, if you can talk about this, what allows Mm -hmm. you to be able to do, to record three or four songs a month? And the reason I ask, the reason I'm asking is because you keep saying that you are hiring musicians and bringing all these people in to be a part of it. It depends on what kind of track I'm doing. Okay. So, Mm -hmm. you know, okay. So let me ask you this. Uh, we'll make this sort of a twofold question, I guess when you are writing music that does not require you bringing in a bunch of yeah. musicians, are you, do you, do you engineer your own stuff? Like, do you, do you know how to do all that kind of stuff or do you have a, a producer that you work with that is tracking and produ- you know, making arrangements and be- beats and all that kind of stuff as well? Um, well, I'm, I've been working with a fantastic producer, named Brian Steckler for the past year. And, um, he's just such a brilliant and fast arranger. Uh, I have to really set up my life to where it's pretty organized. Um, so if I'm working on doing, you know, one, two, three, or four songs a month, I really have to schedule out my day. So, um, like if I'm in a, in a writing, if I'm in a recording season, my house is going to be a mess 
there's probably not going to be a ton of food in the fridge. It's probably going to be Instacarting groceries. I'm not seeing my friends very much. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is the balance. That is, that is the balance for me. But if I'm in, if I'm in a release mode where I'm releasing music, well, then I'm pitching um, the music. I'm, you know, I'm doing the photo shoots. I'm doing my own PR campaign. I'm doing interviews and I'm not in the studio. I'm not recording. So I have to tell my team, Hey, look, while I'm working on this release, I'm not going to be available for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Um, I just can't, I can't do it all. I can't do it all. But when I'm in a writing phase, the house is really clean. There's a lot of food in the fridge. Um, friends are kind of drifting in and out. I'm, um, in a really, really creative mode. I'm really happy. Um, there's not a lot of recording being done. Um, so really what it looks like is I get the songs written and that's the focus for a month or two. And then when that goes into production mode, I don't really have my writer's hat on. So if I'm doing three or four songs a month, that's really for like a four month period. And then the next phase of it is the release. And there's not a lot of writing going on then. There's not a lot of studio time going on then. So Mm -hmm. it's not like three or four songs a month every single month of the year. Yeah, I got you. If that makes sense. Yes. So I honor the season that I'm in because otherwise I find that I'm doing a lot of things and I'm doing none of them well. Right. So I I want to yeah, I want to go deeper into that here in just a minute. I, I, I want to go back to real quick on um, just the fact that you're putting out, that you're working on three or four songs at a time. We'll say it that way over mm-hmm. the course of a couple of months, two, three, four months. Um, and focusing on it that way, are you able to do that now because you've had so many syncs in the in the past? So that, you know, because... Partly, is that, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, part, and that's partly because people are willing to work with me now because I have mm-hmm. those sync licenses. And so they're willing to prioritize right. um, the songs that they do with me, which is terribly unfair because I was just as dedicated, you know, 20 years ago as I am now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, it took a long time to get to this point to be a priority on anybody's <laughs> list. Um, but but that's for people to hear though you know, that you can, that you can get to that level, you know, and it takes time, it takes hard work, but you get to that level and you're, you know, you're living proof that that is possible. It is possible. You just, you, it's, it's hard to not to take things personally. I mean, I have withstood a lot of, um, ups and downs, a lot of kind of dismissive back burner, you know, just not feeling, um, you know, just kind of feeling undervalued. I've gone through a lot of that and Los Angeles is famous for that. I mean, it's just, it permeates the culture. (laughs) Um, but I just wasn't ever going to be bullied into not being a finisher, not finishing a great track, not finishing a great song. Um, And then when something does go on to be successful in spite of, I mean, I've had a lot of songs that have gone on to be really successful when even the people on my team weren't, um, when it wasn't a smooth process. Um, And then having the songs become successful, um, that can be an awkward thing too, you know, to for for both parties involved because you're going i had to you know really drag this person through it and then it became really successful and now it feels weird and everybody's it's it's a shame that that 
people can't kind of get past some of those things. Mm, But I would say that if that's happening to you and especially to female artists, because this is really um, prevalent, I think for female artists, um, if that's happening to you, do not let it keep you down. You need to keep going and you need to keep the faith and you need to honor the success that you've had you might need to plant yourself in a different pot, but that's okay. You are a plant that is entitled to sunlight and rain and all of those things. So you just keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. Try not to let it all get you down because it's not personal. I mean, it's. I think it's partly human nature. Um, it, it's a lot of human nature where people say, well, you know, you don't have any credits or you don't have any of this or you don't have any of that. Why would I invest my time in this? But um, I, I just think you really, you really need to love what you do. And man, if you're not going to believe in it enough to finish it, don't expect anybody. No else one else to. is going to either. No, for sure. Nobody yeah. else is going to either. And I just had that. I mean, I was an annoying child who was always on my dad's heels, going, let's record my song. <laughs> Have you heard my song? You know, but my song is really special. And, you know, so I think I kind of got used to it at a young age because my dad was so busy all the time um, as a professional musician. But I just, I don't know. I just wasn't going to give up. So you just have to have that attitude that you will get there and you're not going to give up. That's great. So uh, uh, you you were talking a few minutes ago. I want to go back to that. um, Talking about the, you know, a season of writing, a season of recording, a season of releasing mm-hmm. and doing PR and things like that. I want to talk about that. And because you're doing, it sounds like you're doing all that yourself. Do you have a team of people yes. that help you with that? Or are you, are you the PR person and the marketing person and the person who has to take care of all the finances and all that kind of stuff? Is that you only, or do you have a team? That That's pretty much that me. Kind of That's pretty okay. much me. I have, I did once, um, hire, uh, a PR company, but you know, the beauty of doing PR yourself is that you end up meeting fabulous people that you end up having relationships with for a really long time. Um, and it's just so much more fun. Uh, so yeah, I, I do that myself. It's hard work. It's not easy. I mean, you have to write your own press releases. Um, and you've got to, can we mm-hmm. talk about that a little bit? I want to I want to pick your brain on the mm-hmm. PR side of things and the releasing of music and putting it out there because we're not talking necessarily just about for sync, but you're putting music out for, a, for as an artist as an artist yes. for radio and for c- CD sales and all that kind of stuff. So, can you talk about how you as the artist are releasing and promoting your own music and like how do you go about doing that? How are you getting your foot in the door yeah. to these you know, to these different uh, uh, outlets to be able to do those types of things and how, you know, how, what's the response like when, when you are doing that? Uh, (laughs) It's so funny because I just, uh, just finished a, a, a PR campaign that I did myself for a song called the good life with Tony Gala. And it was for that, um, just since that's fresh on my mind, um, cause every album that you do, if you're diverse, it's The PR campaign is going to be a little bit different. And I'm an advocate for doing PR yourself if you can, because only, you know, your music the way that you know, your music. So, um, I, there's in the jazz world, for instance, there are a lot of really, really eloquent um, jazz bloggers out there. And I would just spend an afternoon in a coffee shop again. I mean, and uh, just as an aside, if there's anything that you don't enjoy, that's part of the wheel of releasing music because we all love making music, but this businessy stuff, can really make your head spin. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in that kind of a release phase, it's like for me, okay, what cafe around here plays really chill music 
and I can get a mean cappuccino and fully enjoy my day because doing this at home and that's not fun. So I'll go to a great cafe and just do a deep dive on all of the great albums and the great artists and the great singles that some of these jazz bloggers will write about and just find the ones that write uh, or that have done write-ups on happy jazz or jazz that's uh, anthemic um, and just reach out and let them know, hey, I really appreciate your blog. And it's sincere. If somebody is a janky right. writer or whatever, I'm not going to reach. I don't reach out to them because I'm not after getting the press just to get the press. So I'll reach out and say, you know, I'm an artist. Um, this, uh, you know, this song, uh, the good life, um, is kind of like a post pandemic anthem with everything that we've been through. Um, I'd be thrilled if you were to, to give it a spin and consider archiving it in a meaningful way. If you wanted to do a review or an interview or whatever, and you could spend days on end doing that um, and not receive any responses. But you get to know the blogs by actually doing that research. And you reach out again three weeks later and you follow up. And then by the third time or the fourth time, usually they'll follow up and they'll say, hey, you know what? This song just didn't move me. Um, or yeah, I really enjoyed this and I'm going to post about it. And it's, uh, you know, the review is going to come out, um, on such and such a date. And it just, it, it feels like such a wonderful win and you've begun a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, and you continue following their blogs and the relationship is the relationships are so much fun. Um, but there's a lot of rejection that comes into, I mean, I just sent the arranger that I worked with on the good life, a long list of <laughs> rejections and saying, don't let it get in your head. Don't let it get in your head. Look, we got a lot of good press. We got five reviews, you know, critics are critics. Not everybody's going to like what we do, but you know what? The song is, it's fabulous. You know, so you don't yeah. take it all to heart. Are you, um, um, let me ask you this. Are you, mm -hmm. when you're doing that, are you, now you're talking about jazz specifically, spe specifically at the moment, but um, just in general with all the different mm -hmm. genres that you, that you put out um, when you're doing PR, are you specifically going for blogs specifically or are you, are there, are you going for newspaper or radio or, you know, other you know, online. Yes, I've stuff. done like radio campaigns before. I did a college radio campaign um, once and had some really some some good success with that. But call, I learned it was a learning curve because I learned that college radio. I was just not hipster enough for most college radio stations. So yeah. um, I stay away from that now after having done that, um, mm -hmm. because I know that I'm not hipster enough for that stuff. My stuff is more mainstream, but if I'm releasing Christmas stuff, um, the Christmas blogging community, the Christmas podcasters, those people are so much fun. I mean, I'm so glad that I just sat down for a couple of weeks and reached out to all of them because all of these years later, we're all great friends. And every time I release Christmas stuff or at any time they write about a new Christmas release, we're, we're into what each other's doing. And, and yeah. that relationship, those relationships are lifelong. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the, um, the bloggers actually took one of my songs, Jingle Jangle and synced it to his Christmas lights in his house Nice. <laughs> and did this whole yeah. Christmas light show and posted it. And, you know, if I would have just hired a PR company to do that, I would have missed out on those great relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would encourage um, any artist, don't be afraid of this stuff, because I think as long as you're respectful and consistent um, and you're not hounding anybody, but you're just believing in your work and you're respecting the work of the person that you're reaching out to, um, really beautiful things can blossom from it. I mean, That's great. 
just even a lot of the press that uh, that we got for The Good Life, for, for Tony's song, The Good Life, it came from the Christmas bloggers. You know, they just saw on Facebook that I, you know, had a new single and they said, oh, this would be great New Year's song or, you know, so, so you never know, you never sure. know where, um, you know, what's going to happen, but that's part of the adventure too. Cool. I have just fully embraced that this is such a grassroots industry anymore. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Unless you're, yeah. Unless you're signed to a label or, or yeah. management or whoever that's, that's where it, they give you those teams around you to, to put you out to the public. Sure you know, you have to do either do it yourself or you have to go out and be able to hire people who yes. do those specific things, you know, and it's all of it's great. You're going to get different. I think you're going to get different results from each direction that you go, that you go about doing it, but just because of the nature of it. Um, but I love that you're but bloom uh, where planted. Right. You know what I mean? If you're not sure. planted in a record label situation with that whole machine behind you, and nowadays, even if you have that, there's absolutely no guarantee. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, even though it's it's very much the wild, wild west for independent artists, um, what a time for, to be an independent artist and to be able to do all of these things. So I'm trying, not trying, but what I've, the attitude that I've adopted is I get to do this. I get to reach out to these blogs. I get to have these amazing relationships with these people who have these podcasts. I mean, look at this. It's like here as independent artists, we started with catch the moon and all these years later, um, you and I are talking. Yeah. You know? Sure. Yeah. And that's great. Yeah. That that we get to do that. And you know, we, the two of us get to actually make our living as independent yes. musicians and artists. We make our full living doing this and not many mm-hmm. people get to say that. And that's uh we don't say that braggingly, but a huge blessing that we are, that we're given the opportunity to, to do that because it is, it is a rare thing as in, as yeah. indie artists uh, who are not signed and have, have a huge machine behind you, pushing you and giving all this money to do it, you know? So, um, so tell people that are indie artists and that are having to do their own PR. Yeah. Um, what are the best places to reach out to, to do PR? You talked about blogging. Um, but like when you're like, what are all the different outlets that you are going to when you are pushing stuff for PR when you put out? Well, I think we, we all know about submit hub and submit hub is very, very, very difficult. Um, what is so? Tell us if about you go that. to so submithub. Dot, yeah, if you go to submithub, they have um, filters where you can you put in your genre of your song or your your album or whatever it is that you are um, promoting, and it's got to be within like a a thirty day window of the release. So you don't want to go try. And, you know, go on Submit Hub for a song that you released three years ago. It's new releases only. So you put in your genre and you can put in, um, you can check like filters like really good bloggers. Those are the high ranking bloggers. Um, You can do premiere requests and they'll filter everything for you and show you the blogs that accept your genre um and would consider reviewing it or putting it on their spotify playlist but you need to do your research too and check out um actually go to their blogs and read the reviews that they've done in the past make sure that they're a good writer (laughs) make sure that um even though those filters say that they accept your genre, make sure that they, they actually do. Um, and it just takes a little bit of time. That sounds really complex, but just going that little extra mile is a big time saver. Um, and then with you, you submit your music and within 48 hours, you'll get a response that will say, 
um, you know, this wasn't for us, best of luck, or this was the reason why we didn't, um, we didn't choose to review it, um, or we're going to review it and it will post on such and such a date, or we're going to add it to our Spotify playlist and post about it. So that's one route. That's the fastest route, but I don't rely just on submit hub. I go there, but I actually do a forensics search for, I mean, even people, even writer, like writers that I love, um, uh, that review big artists, I reach out to them too. And I'll just, I'll read the latest reviews that they did and just reach it out to them over email and say, Hey, you know, I'm so-and-so I'm an independent artist been following you for years. Loved this review that you just did. And I genuinely do. Um, and, and I'll say, you know, I have a new album. These songs are featured in blah, 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 blah. Uh, gosh, it would just be such an honor if you were to give this a spin. Um, and I'll reach out to, I mean, there's a guy named Martin Johns, um, who has a, he's, he's got his own blog. He actually shut it down recently, but he's one of the most eloquent writers out there. And he has a, a Christmas blog called Stubby's Christmas. And I was blown away when I went to his blog and reached out to him. He's been reviewing my music, my Christmas stuff for years. Um, uh, Marion Bright is another fabulous Aaron Hinton uh, owns Marion Bright and he does wonderful reviews. Um, he's just our politics lineup. <laughs> I just love that guy. You know, I just, I just research the good bloggers out there outside of submit hub. And I reach out individually mm-hmm. according to what it is that I'm releasing at the time. Are you reaching out to like newspaper or magazines, music yes. magazines that do that kind of all that stuff as well? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Good. I just want people to know, like, mm-hmm. it's all possible. You know, it's you all possible. You have to put your back into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes even just picking up the phone. Um, I mean, I reached out to a, a great blogger, Jeff Westover, a couple of years ago, and he wasn't responding to my emails. And I just, you know six weeks later, just picked up the phone and called and left a message. And he, the next day wrote up a review and said, you know, this artist has been so persistent. She actually picked up the phone and (laughs) called me and left me a message, you know, and, and he and I have been in contact for, um, for three years now. So, and you know, honestly, I've even done that with some directors, you know, some, there's a lifetime director who's, um, whose movies I really, really, really love. And the first time that I called him, he yelled at me. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So we gotta, we gotta know this. We gotta hear this story because this is, uh, I feel like this is going to be really good and, and helpful for some people listening. Yeah. Well, I had called him, um, which you should, which you're not supposed to do, right? (laughs) Well, I don't know whether you're supposed to do it or not, but okay. he only had his phone number on the website. So there was no um, contact sheet. And I just thought, you know what? I love this guy's movie. It, like, I just, I love these last three or four that I've seen. And so I just called him up and I said, hi, my name is Rhea. I'm an independent artist. Okay. I've been following your movies um, for a while. I love this. I love that. I've got some songs. What did you say your name was? Right. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. Please don't call me again. Ouch. You know, and I hung up and I was like, "Mm, I'll give it about two or three weeks. (laughs) And so I waited, um, about three weeks. And at that point I had found his email. And I emailed him and I said, I'm so sorry to, you know, do have interrupted your day. Um, But I found your email address. I hope it's okay. Again, I want to say how much I love these, you know, these movies, especially. Um, 
here's five songs that they're one stop. Um, I've got some street cred. If you want to check it out, I hope to hear from you. And it took about three, four weeks. And he reached out and he said, Rhea, uh, I really um, appreciate your, your email. Thank you so much for sending this to me. I actually, here's a script for one of my movies that's coming up. If there's no music in it now, tell me what you got. Watch it. Send me, um, wow. send me what, what you think would work. So I really, I mean, and I sat there for about like four hours with that movie, like a music supervisor would. And I, you know, I even, I took instrumentals and stuff like that. And, um, you know, kind of just, just said, okay, th these sections here would work. I sent him a really detailed list. He ended up syncing four of my songs in that movie. And then three of my songs in another movie three months later, Wow. Um, and he sends me scripts now and then, and, you know, we just put things in and I just really liked his stuff. Um, and so I gave it another swing and you know what, it's been four years later and he and I are great friends now, but yeah, the first time I talked to him, he yelled at me, but that was <laughs> not the end of the story. Right. Have you, re have you reminded him of the fact that he yelled at you the first time? <laughs> no, no, but you know what? We have a good. <laughs> a good band. Does he know, um, does he remember that he yelled at you the first time? I'm does sure. he even know that? Okay. I'm sure he does, uh, but it's, it, it doesn't even matter. Right. It doesn't That's even just matter. A funny but, thing though. Right. At this point, well, I'm yeah. like, but the thing is, is that I think because I have been, I was banging around in LA for all of these years. It's just, you have to have an attitude like next, yeah. next, what's the next best step. Because if you're not going to stop what you're doing, if you're not going to let um, these things get you down, you have to keep walking your path and you have to keep trying. You will miss 100% of the, the, the swings that you don't take. So, and I just decided, you know, after a lot of snot cries, you know, or it, with a bottle of wine on the phone with my mom. You know, I mean, even she would say to me, are, are you sure that you want to continue doing this? And I, and I would really soul search and, you know, yeah, sometimes I would really just hide for a week and stay in my pajamas. But after so many years, it was like, you know what? I'm not going to let anybody's no have me hiding for a week because right. that is a week of my life. Sure. That is. Yeah, and you that can't is get a, it back. You can't get it back. So you got to keep going. You got to yeah. keep going. Well, that's really encouraging, I think, for, for people to hear that story and to know that, you know what, you can reach out directly. And most people don't reach out to the director. Usually it's going to be a music mm -hmm. supervisor because they're the ones who typically are, are going to get your songs pitched and placed into those things. But it, the, if you can get directly in contact with a director or producer of of a, of a movie or a show or whatever, and mm -hmm. build that relationship to where the, to where you can, you know, that's amazing that he sent you a movie that was not even released yet and said, here, what have you got that we can put in this? You know, that's an incredible thing. So let me ask you this. When you did that for that first movie, mm -hmm. um, and we're kind of listening to it, trying to figure it out, did you write new music for that movie or did you have songs already that, that you thought would fit that he ended up placing for that? Do you remember? I had songs that I thought would fit, but I, I let him know, listen, anything you need. I mean, I'm, we're willing to work on spec. So, um, if, if these don't work for you, please let me know. Okay. And, um, you know, he just wrote back and said, Nope, I think these are going to be great. Here's the, are you okay with these fees? Um, and, um, you know, let's, let's get them in there. Yeah. That's but, amazing. you know, it's just sometimes you got to just follow that wild thing in your belly that just says, pick up the phone, give them a call or, yeah. you know, break, break through the noise somehow, but be genuine about it. Do your research and make sure that you know who you're talking to. You don't want to be um, calling up somebody. It's just like any, if somebody um, sends me an email or, you know, a direct message saying, Hey, you've had so many placements. You really seem to have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in sync. And, um, I'd love to write with you. 
but they have no idea what kind of music I actually write or anything about me. Um, it's, it's a little off putting. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have been as motivated to reach out to that director if I didn't genuinely like really enjoy his work. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I even said in my email, like I am your, like, I'm your audience. I, I am the onesie wearing popcorn making, <laughs> hanging out with my sister and watching your stuff. I love, I love what you've done, you know, and I would love to and help you if I can. Yeah. You know, it was genuine. Sure. So go, go out into the world with your, with your heart on your sleeve in a way, you know, um, I think, and that's the beauty of, of being an artist is that you can do that. You can really say, you know, Hey, I don't have this all figured out, but I've got something that I think would, it would be really cool with what you're doing. And you're an artist too. And I think this is fantastic. Um, it's, it's, it's a fully organic thing. It's not like, it's, it's not like you're, you're coming in as a suit saying, well, I really think we could make a whole lot of money together. And this is my agenda. And blah, 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 blah. I mean, let yourself be inspired. And I think that that energy is really infectious. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're, when you're putting, getting music synced, um, tell, tell the audience, like, what are some shows, some movies or some networks that you've had placements on just so people have a, are familiar with what you do. Um, okay. I actually would have to like, look at my IMDB page. <laughs> I don't have this stuff memorized. Oh, but um, so you've got your, you're big enough to have your own IMDB page. So that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> at least there's something listed on it now after all of these years. Okay. So my recent placements have been, we know um, Lifetime, right? Lifetime Network. Of course, Lifetime. Um, I have a, a a song in One of Us is Lying right now on Peacock. Um, I've got okay. a song in the docuseries Growing Up on Disney+. Plus. Um, got a song in Forever Hamptons, The Neighborhood, um, 911, McGrubber, 20-somethings Austin, Deadly Seduction on Lifetime, Sorority Sister Killer on Lifetime, um, the show Younger, which Robin Erding um, is the music supervisor. I love Robin. Um, All Rise, The Twelve Dates of Christmas, The War with Grandpa, Black Christmas, okay. uh, Hallmark, Noel, Disney. Play. I mean, a lot of a lot of a lot stuff, of and some ads like you know a, a Victoria's Secret ad and um, their in-app holiday ad i think it's for 2020 um and like t-mobile and xtb so so that's great um that's amazing that you got that broad of a range that, that you're getting stuff in so when when you're doing that so with the lifetime director you went you went straight to the head guy and was able to get stuff in with that but most people aren't able to do that that's not the direction you're most people are going to be told go straight to the director because you're going to get yelled at, right? Don't ever call me back. <laughs> but so we, you know, generally we, we are told go either to the music supervisor or mm -hmm. get signed to a sync licensing agency. And then they will pitch your music to the supervisors who will then in turn, hopefully get your music into the shows or the movies. Um, yes. And I have done all of those things. So right. I, I do have a licensing agent. Um, Christina Benson um, of Sweet on Top. She's Sweet amazing. Sweet on Top. Yes, she is. Sweet on Top. She's we, uh, amazing. And Yeah, I write for Christina. Okay, yeah. She's I just I the, the energy with Christina and the um you know, I love that she she studied opera. She has kind of this vintagey <laughs> uh, thing, you know. I mean, she loves to bake. She like sews her own clothing and things like that. And I make a lot of retro music. So it just kind of seems like an energetic fit. Right. Um, but she was somebody, you know, that I, I was referred to her, um, 
through two or three different people. They said, you need to, you know, send your stuff to Christina Benson. And I signed a contract with her and we didn't speak. I mean, we, we signed the contract and I didn't hear from her, not a peep for like a year and a half. And then she had gotten several sinks for me in one year. Um, so my point is, is that just because you don't hear anything doesn't mean that something's not happening under that soil. Right. The seed had been planted and it took a couple of years for um, it to sprout. But that, that woman has really gone to bat for my music. I am, I am so grateful to her. Um, and I, I had a few non-exclusives um, with a couple of other sync agents and it's, you know, that's a tricky thing. They say not to sign with too many sync agents, but when I was just starting to make the Christmas stuff um, and didn't really have a whole lot of credibility in that genre, um, you know, you sign these contracts and you don't hear much about where they're being pitched or what's going on. So you really don't know. You just go, well, I guess I'll try it here and I'll try it here and I'll try it here. Um, so that's what I, what I did and ended up having some solid success with a few other, um, sync licensing agents, but I have developed relationships with music supervisors, um, over the years, just being in Los Angeles and, um, having placements. And I just send, I, I also send music supervisors, my music directly, um, when I've got it, but, and sometimes they choose to go through my sync agent. Um, and that's great too. I mean, it's, it's, I'm grateful for all of it, but yeah, the thing is, is that before I was getting a lot of licenses through my sync agents, um, or even through Christina, who's my main, uh, my main sync person, I was just trying to get to know music supervisors and pitch my stuff directly. So those relationships developed organically um, in tandem with my sync agents pitching my stuff. But I do hear that nowadays it's really hard to develop direct relationships with, uh, with music supervisors. So maybe starting with a sync agent is, is best. Yeah. I think unless you're able to, you know, a lot of times we go to conferences or yeah. a, a different events where supervisors are in attendance and they're judging something or they're speaking at a, at a conference or whatever it is. And we get an opportunity to, to meet and talk with them and start building a relationship. And a lot of times they'll tell you, hey, send me some stuff. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, in that scenario, yes, I think it's okay to do that. But maybe not just email them directly out of the blue and say, hey, I've got some music and I think would fit well with whatever, you know, you're working on that kind of a thing, but that's where you need to go start with a sync agency is Mm -hmm. down that path there. So, um, but that's great. Thank you for, for sharing all that kind of stuff. Um, Absolutely. And you know, the uh, Google is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So if you just Google um, sync licensing um, agencies um, or or follow Ari's take, um, A A R I. Mm -hmm. Ari's take and he, you know, he's just a fantastic resource for, um, sync agencies and, and all of that. And just know that there is a blessing behind every no. So it's, it's kind of like, think of it like, you know, I, I tend to look at things like the Pareto principle where, you know, 80% of your harvest will come from 20% of your seeds. So if you're reaching out to, um, <clears throat> to a satchel of, of sync agencies, if you hear back from two of them, that's good. That's right. fantastic. And, you know, even if they take the time to reach out and tell, you know, that's fantastic. They reached out, they got back to you, follow up with the new music. 
with them when you can. Just don't stop. Sure. Just don't stop. L- let me ask you this. Do you ever, have you ever been in a situation where you have been with a sync agency mm-hmm. and then have decided to leave that particular agency uh, to either to go work with another one. I know that we can work with multiple agencies mm-hmm. at, a, at the same time, sharing different songs, not, not giving one song to seven different agencies. No, that's, right. that's a no, no, I know that. But as far as like, you know, I'm going to write these songs and pitch these songs to this agency here and then write this other batch of songs that's going to go to this agency here. Um, mm-hmm. After being in with multiple ones, have you decided that, you know, I'm not going to write four or five or seven different ones. I'm only going to work with maybe two or three. Um, and if so, why, why would you do that particularly if you can talk about that? Um, well, I mean, for me, sometimes it just depends on the deal that's involved. Like for instance, if it's a sync agency that commissions part of your writers and part of your publishing, um, that's not something that I'm going to invest in long term, just because I think ethically nobody should be commissioning your writers. Um, so those that that's not something that that I would do long term. And also, just if if I have a really great relationship with one or two sync agents, um, and it's not broken, then I'm just going to be loyal to those couple of places because I feel like if the relationship is really strong, I don't need to date other people. Right. You know? Sure. So, but sometimes it takes, you know, dating a lot of different people Mm -hmm. to figure out who your match is. And that's okay. That's okay. And sometimes it is time to end a relationship and say, you know, this, this isn't, though this is working fabulously for you, it's not working great for me. Um, so I, this, this isn't something that I want to continue. Um, and that's okay too. I mean, sometimes you do have to release, um, some relationships and sometimes that will happen with you too. Sure. You know, somebody will, will tell you, look, I just don't, we haven't had, um, a lot of success, success with your music that we've had it in the catalog for a long time. I think it's best to part ways and that's, a, it just free, it just creates space in your world for another opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the trick is, uh, we were talking about this earlier in the, in the conversation about, you know, it, sometimes it takes years for a song to get placed. It can sit in a library or whatever it is mm-hmm. um, with an agency for a long time and nothing happens to it. And, you know, and we don't know as artists and writers, we don't know when an agent is pitching the music necessarily. You know, like you said, with, with Christina Sweet on Top originally, it took a year and a half or so after signing with her before mm-hmm. you even heard anything and all, but, but she was working that whole time and got you a lot of placements. Right. But, um, Christina's but, the best. Yeah. She's fantastic. And she does a great yeah. job with all that stuff, but there are, um, but there are other agents out there that, may not you may not be getting you know you may not be hearing from them for one because like i said it took you know it took, takes a long time to, for those things to be happening but if you don't know that if they're not you don't know that that they're being pitched and you're not hearing back and it's like okay is is this even being done is anybody doing anything right on, on any level and that's that's the hard thing i mean that right? that is certainly happened in my case i had i didn't know what agents were doing and nobody was telling me anything. So I had signed, you know, the same satchel of songs to, I think three different, three different agents, but, and then all of a sudden three, four or five years later, it's like, it's gangbusters and this stuff is getting placed from this agent and that agent and that agent. Um, but I was just at the time 
flying blind, you know, kind of just swinging with my eyes closed, not knowing what was going on. So it wasn't, so that's not your fault. Right. If you're just being an artist and just trying to find the best place for your music. But then when you do settle, uh, on an agent or two that you want to work with, with your catalog, make sure that that, that it's a, it's a good relationship that you feel really good about the deal. Mm -hmm. Um, and that it's not predatory. Make sure that you're not, you know, and by predatory, I mean, you know, don't, don't sign egregious deals where you're paying like 100% of your publishing on an exclusive, um, yeah, just, just stuff like that, you know, look out for your future because you need to have an income that's going to sustain you, um, during the slow times. Um, and that's, that's what your writers and your publishing is supposed to provide you with, um, is a little bit of stability, um, so that you can continue making new music. Sure. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, this has been amazing. I, we could, we could talk probably for another couple hours. There's just so, <laughs> so much to do, but, um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to hold you for too long. So as we wrap it up and you've been, you know, I mean, you've been giving amazing advice all throughout. So, but as we do wrap up here, can you, can you share any, um, any do's or don'ts for people that are wanting to get into sync licensing as an artist or any of the, any of the different facets mm -hmm. that you've been associated with in as an artist. And then also as a sync artist as well. Um, what are some things to, you definitely need to do these things, or maybe you should definitely avoid these things, <laughs> you know? Okay. Uh, show appreciation. Okay. Always show appreciation for your collaborators, um, for your sync agents, um, for your musicians. I mean, those guys are, they're, they're golden for your producers, for the person who is, you know, if you're working with an independent artist, who's pitching your songs, just show appreciation because it's so easy to get in your little mole run of your to-do list. And, um, it, this can be a very solitary job. So encouragement appreciation goes a really long way for the morale for everybody all across the board. Okay. Um, I would say if you're looking to get into sync, you may go through the first six months of, uh, um, feeling like you're phoning it in. Um, but don't let that last for too long. Don't abandon your artist self because the world needs your voice. Yes. There are certain themes that are needed in sync and there are certain styles, but bring your authenticity to it. Don't abandon your authenticity because that is the most valuable thing that you can bring to the table. The rest of it is just craft. It's just craft. Um, and I would say less is more. I, I know some people might really disagree with me and that's okay. But I would say working with high quality, a few high quality um, collaborators that you love working with is going to be it's going to re-energize every other area in your life. So try not to get sucked into chasing after people who have more credits than you do or more credibility, because a lot of times um, those collaborations may not even be the best ones. Um, you know, it might be that you're, best friend who has a home studio and you guys have a great time working together, that that is the relationship that is the best collaborator for you at this time. Um, so value whatever stage you're in and bloom where planted. There is a solution within every problem. 
you just have to like get still enough and wait for that answer because mm-hmm. resistance great. is your friend you know it's it's your friend and you're talking to a girl <laughs> it's had a lot of resistance and ended up thriving miraculously. And usually it's because I just wake up and I say, what is the next best move for today? What can I do today? Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you so very much. This has been a fantastic conversation. And I'm so glad we finally got to spend some time together after all these years and getting to know each other better. And, um, Hopefully at some point we can do some writing together and I would love that. See Mark, what we I can, think you're so talented. Yeah, see what we can come up with. I think that the combination of what we're doing um, put together, I think could make some really cool stuff. And um, I would love to just give it a shot and see what happens. And so um, let's figure that out. And um, but again, thank you for being on the show. I'm excited for people to hear all of this uh, amazing advice and hopefully they'll put it into practice into their careers as well. So yeah, don't don't lose faith. I think this this music tribe, if you're born in this time and you have the heart and the spirit for music, um then you're in quite a time in history to be an independent artist. And there are a lot of opportunities. It just takes time. Yeah. It just be, takes time. And to be successful at it as an independent artist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We're definitely living in the best, the best era to be able to do that. Well, I think. Right Amen. Now. So awesome. Well, Ray, I thank you so much again for being on the show and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Right. Thank you for having me, Marty. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. All right, guys, there you have it. I hope you had a great time listening to our conversation today. I hope you take what we've talked about today and find ways to apply it to your career as well. Please be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you listen to it on. And please share it with all of your friends so that we can continue to get this message out to everyone around the world. Remember, Edenbrook Productions is here to help if you need consulting services via phone, Skype, Zoom, or FaceTime. Let us know how we can help you begin to make a living in the music industry.